Thank you so much, Ranjit, for this wonderful presentation. And, and I think that the, the way in which you uh, addressed um, this particular painting was also the way perhaps uh, you, know, you would actually construct a poem or deconstruct a poem. And I think that that's something that I found in both your presentations, because both of you are poets. <laughs> and as it happens, and you are, of course, a poet, painter, as well as uh, you know, somebody who's written uh, some very interesting plays as well. So uh, it, it's, 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 it's deeply interesting to see how uh, two artists, in a way, confront a fellow artist's work, and um, how you're able to talk about uh, both the, the, the political um, uh, context, but also speak about the formal choices that are made. And also formal choices which are not just uh, uh, calibrated in a very conscious um, manner, but formal choices that actually are discovered through the process of making. So, uh, Give, can I uh, can I ask you? This is not really a question, but it's something that uh, you know. I mean, I, I just want us to reflect on that. Uh, th it, the process of painting uh, is is both uh, a conscious act, but it's also uh, an intuitive process. And um, every day when you actually face the canvas, um, how, how do you calibrate this, this process, you know what I mean, which is, which, is, which is between consciousness and intuition? Yeah. Um, I suspect that uh, different painters will do it in different ways. Um, like uh, you know, very simple. Uh, like how, you know, at the start of a painting, you know, how much drawing do you do on your canvas, or don't you? you know? uh, I think that some painters would have uh, an, a fairly elaborate drawing, you know, which uh, they may ignore uh, as they proceed with the painting process, or which they may stick to. Uh, I myself have the very minimal amount of uh, drawing when I start a work. Um, I think what might be more common to different kinds of painters would be the fact that uh, they both know where the painter, painting is leading and they don't know. And I think uh, the negotiating this uh, uh, knowledge and lack of knowledge day after day is what leads you to uh, a work which ultimately you say is a, as complete as it can be. Uh, so it's very much like. Uh, catching the tail of yesterday's work uh, to get on to the body of today's work. As far as, uh, as, far as you're not Ouroboros who's actually swallowing your own tail. <laughs> uh, no, but that, that's, that's beautifully put. Um, and uh, may I now turn to Ranjit. And um, uh, there was something that you actually said uh, during your close reading of Street Corner, which I thought was very interesting, and it also links to my reading of Nagarik, in fact. Uh, you talked about how this, uh, Street Corner seems to be a very restful painting, and yet, as we could see, there were different cells in which all kinds of activities were happening. So again, this contradiction between something very restful and yet full of movement. Uh, and, and in Nagrik again, it's the same thing. I, I talk about how there is a sense of terav in the work, yeah? a sense of stillness. And yet, all the planes are either mismatched or upside down. In fact, there is also uh, one narrative uh, at the bottom corner of the painting, which is actually literally upside down, of a woman reading in her living room. And you see it uh, in reverse in the, in the reflection of a mirror. So uh, would you like to address this, this contradiction between stillness and kinesis in his yeah. work. You know, Give in the Daedalus essay, is it in the Daedalus essay? You make that beautiful point when you dwell on one of Sudhir's paintings and it's you, Daedalus. it is the Daedalus essay, right? Where you say that uh, on the face of it, this looks like a water body which has been poisoned by effluent. But then you say that 
<laughs> it's not an. It's another essay. It's in. It's in a catalog essay. <laughs> but where you say that the excluded element might well be violence or anguish, and and you also talked about you refer to this way of how one might exclude violence and anguish, and then arrive at uh, an image that tells you that something is amiss, but has either been transcended or continues in a resilient manner. I think this is a very extremely subtle reading of Sudhir's work. And I try and maybe build from that to answer your question. And see, I think that, uh, again, in a painting like Street Corner, and in many of Sudhir's evocations of the city, I think what is sought to be not excluded, but to be made subtle is disquiet. So for me, there's a tremendous sense of unrest and disquiet that inhabits Sudhir's work. But there will always be either the geometry of a city that is about to be built or uh, pulling out, pulling away and a panoramic vision of the peri-urban. But there are ways in which, or in this case, what I call the median scale, the calibration of focal length, where I think Sudhir's question here is how to allow that unrest and disquiet to be voiced, but not allow it to completely dominate. Of course, in, there, are, there are phases of the work where it does dominate, but even there, as, you, as both of you have said, there's a choreographic impulse to see how that violence could be seen in a, as a dance, for instance. But I think in, in many of the, 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 the urban meditations, this, to my mind, is what is happening. Because also remember that uh, through, this, through these 50 years, so these worked in Thane and Bombay, and this has been an exceptionally, we tend to normalize and naturalize this. It's been an exceptionally violent city, all the way from the late 60s. Uh, there have been cycles of violence, industrial unrest, the brutal suppression of labor movements, assassinations, crime waves, and yet we survive. And not to mention all the other more recent things, certainly in the post-1992 phase. So, Whilst not wishing to pin the work to that kind of material basis, I cannot imagine that that has not been an immediate environment to respond to, and which becomes a kind of ground note of the work. I don't know if this answers your question. This also leads me to, um, uh, to reflect on Riot, the, pa the, the painting Riot, which uh, Sudhir painted um, post the uh, demolition of the Babri Masjid and the riots that followed. And um, there, of course, what, what you have is, uh, is, 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 is an immediate reaction to the, the violence that was unfolding in front of his eyes. And uh, you have the figure of the, the, this deranged, grieving woman right at the center of the work. Uh, so um, it's also interesting to actually think about how uh, with, with riot, in fact, I mean, Ranjit, you have talked about how it was with riot that actually he, you know, I mean, the collective falls apart. Or it, even the desire for the collective to come together for Sudhir, which is there in almost all his works, whether it's in Street Corner or whether it's in Nagrik, there, there, there is a certain kind of rupture. Uh, so uh, since we've, we've already read that in your book about how the collective falls apart, maybe I'd like to address um, Give. Uh, you know, and, 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 and ask him how he reads Riot, for instance, because here it's not like the construction, construction worker washing her face. It's, it, uh, you know, th there, there, there are wrinkles on the face of this uh, deranged woman. She's completely cr uh, crazed with grief. Um, uh, her, 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 her whole demeanor is disheveled, and you know, I mean, she, she's, uh, she's, she's, she's actually, uh, uh, her mind is, is, is fevered, and it's on the edge. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I probably need time to stand again before the painting and you know, talk with you about it. Uh, but from memory, you know, I'm a, of my memory of this particular painting, what comes to me first is the fact of, again, uh, ironical, uh, 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 that how, uh, uh, at a moment of riot in a city, different things happen at different points, you know. Like, uh, you know, uh, just around the corner, a uh, couple of people may be sitting in a restaurant and having a cup of tea, while, you know, somebody's being stabbed to death 
uh, on the other side. And they may not even know of what each other are doing. So it is some of that kind of quality that that pain painting conveys to me. Because there are different you know, uh, uh, street corners and levels at which uh, specific things are happening, which are, you know, uh, uh, just not all of them are concentrated on the fact of the riot, which is beginning to unfold. This is actually very interesting because the way I remember the work is where, uh, I mean, the way I, re I would read it is that often in Sudhir's work. It's, it's almost, almost like yeah. a fire. If you, say, yes. if you think of the riot as yeah. a fire, mm. the fire has not singed everybody yet. Yes. It's like, you know, it's moving from mm. here to there, mm. and, and mm. you know, uh, different parts of one's clothes mm. are still mm. intact. Mm. That's, no, that's, that's, a, that's a very Sorry to be a say something amusing about a horrible thing like that. But, you know, I mean, I just, I'm just trying to uh, uh, describe the, how, how it penetrates in different ways to different parts of the city. Yes. That, that, that's, that's a very interesting reading. Um, the way I remember the work, and maybe then we'll go, go to Ranjit and how he remembers the work, is that uh, for me, normally in Sudhir's works, normally in Sudhir's works, you always have a pole or a pillar. Uh, at least uh, in in these works, uh, you know, I mean, uh, th that you'd have in the, in in the in the seventies and the eighties, and uh, uh, it, 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 there is a sense of the, the axis mundi, you know, uh, and uh, and and uh, the pillar or the pole where people come together, they assemble, they gather, uh, they 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 are apart and yet together. And when I saw riot, I realized that there was no pillar or pole. Uh, that 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 instead of the pillar or the pole where people gather together in their separate but and yet uh, and 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 yet unified ways, you actually have the figure of this crazed woman. And that also then connects me to Atul Dodia's works, you know, in the uh, in the post Babri Masjid demolition phase. So again, you have this this crazed woman. You know, uh, who uh, in a way is is, uh, is is almost like a Goya-esque figure who has lost her mind, and and, and is shown in a very grotesque manner. So I would see uh, the woman at the center of uh, Sudhir Patwadan's riot uh, in conjunction with Atul Dodia's uh, you know a figure of uh, of of this woman who in a way symbolizes um, Mother India. But, uh, but, but she is, she's not this resplendent Mother India that we would see, but actually uh, it's, 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 it's somebody who has, uh, you know, who's, an, who's actually inhabiting a no man's land and, uh, and, and, and has no anchor whatsoever. So maybe now we could ask you also to interpret this work. Um, not maybe interpret so much as annotate this and, uh, you know, what you also, but, Atul Dodia's amazing series that then proceeded from these evocations of Shabari, which then went on to be, you know, towards Tearscape, for instance. Uh, and it's amazing, as you were speaking, I suddenly thought those were incredibly difficult years for all of us as individuals, as a polity, as a society, after 6 December 1992. And somehow we convinced when we are writing the history of this time, we tend, or some of us tend to see that as the turn towards for lack of another description, new media, where certain artists felt that so great were the political pressures and the psychic pressures that you needed to expand beyond the painted frame to bring in moving image, social space, uh, interactivity, and other ways of articulating the anguish and the situation and what was to be done. But just as you were speaking, I thought something that doesn't make itself so explicit always is that uh, there were also painters who then made a kind of turn towards symbol making. Uh, painters who otherwise had been immersed in and preoccupied with social realities or the creation of fictive spaces and the, uh, the blur between fictive spaces and figures and, and social reality. And they moved in the direction of this kind of symbol making. So, you know, as you dwell on this figure of the solo isolated, deranged woman, for instance, which is kind of take on Mother India, as we've discussed in the past, maybe there was that turn as well that we've discussed in terms of individual artists, but it was also a kind of symbolic turn, probably. You know, Give in, in light of all this, I was, thinking, I was thinking of something when you talked earlier about how uh, it's a balance between your knowledge of where the painting is going and your lack of knowledge. Uh, 
you started a painting long ago called Riot, yes. which th by the time you finished with it, turned into a child saved from the fire. Yeah. Yes, and I remember, in fact, I was thinking exactly about that work, uh, this uh, incredible blue and yellow work. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking exactly of, of that work. Maybe could you, could you talk a little bit about that work, please? Uh, yeah, I, I, I knew that I wanted to paint fire, you know, just because it is uh, so difficult to paint uh, convincingly. And I wanted to paint it like it would be recognized as clear fire by anybody who saw the painting. And then, of course, you know, things were happening, or I'm always happening in the country. I, I had the image of this child. So I started out with the child and the fire. And, as, and it's a fairly small work. And as I continued to work, uh, certain forms like heads and bodies could be seen through the fire on the other side. And they were not very, very clearly, as clearly etched as the main figure of the child and the fire. So that it became a kind of a sense of not my not knowing as I proceeded with the work, whether the child was being cast into the fire or whether the child was being rescued from the fire. And I could at some point, if I wanted to, have made that clear by showing that those shadowy figures were either menacing figures or they were compassionate figures. But in fact, I left that ambiguity. So that, you know, till today, I don't know myself what is happening. Actually, that, that's and, 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 you know, I, thought, I think that, that, uh, that a painting like that could deal with that ambiguity. Because, you know, in the heat of uh, 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 terrible social catastrophes like riots, in fact, one, one doesn't know who's an enemy and who's friend, you know? Yes. Can I just come back to that? Yes. Because uh, it, one would also prize these moments in, uh, in many of Sudhir's drawings, for instance. And one great painting, I'm not sure it's in here, because they really, your show in its scale demands that one come back repeatedly on pilgrimage. But uh, there is a work which, as soon as I saw it, whenever I saw it, it reminded me of, um, Abraham and Isaac, the sacrifice. Uh, and there's a drawing by Sudhir where there's a man standing in front of a pit. You know, works like that, you wonder what is going on. Is someone being rescued from a shaft or has someone been thrown into a shaft? Is the child saved? Is it being offered a sacrifice? I think there are these amazing moments of ambiguity that also ask us to to deal with our own impulses, whether they're philanthropic or misanthropic, as the case might be. So, uh, and it, I'm pinning that to the question you asked, what happened in the 90s with that isolated figure? I think there was the symbol making turn, perhaps, the isolated figure, the dispersed crowd, this was telling us something about ourselves. But there were also these other works, which I think obliged us to see how we ourselves were participants in in the destruction of our own society. So I think that's what makes for the complexity of, of that phase in, in Sudhir's work. And actually, yeah, beautifully put, both of you. And um, in fact, it also connects with the painting that you showed of killing. Again, you know, the, the, the choreographed uh, violence that you showed earlier. So, so again, as a group, you don't know, uh, are, are they trying to kill that man or are they all holding on to each other together just just for that moment because uh, you know they, they, they can't deal with that confusion so uh, so, so again it's it's left ambiguous and, and I think that uh, the trope of ambiguity is something that definitely uh, you know we, we, we uh, actually it's a, it's a, it's a prize tro trope in any painters uh, oeuvre because without ambiguity you would just be dealing in uh, cliches and binaries but I think uh, what is important is how each painter, in a way, calibrates uh, her or his own ambiguous approach towards their work. Uh, perhaps at, at this point, I'd like to you know, open out the conversation. And if anybody has any questions. In many of Atwala's works, uh, there is a certain element of, uh, certain element I think uh, 
is that of an artist looking at the canvas and saying, okay, how capacious can my pictorial space be? What, how many vocabularies can I really deal with? And I'm going to break artist critic privilege, so to speak, Sudhir, by talking about how, well, more than 25 years ago, when, you know, you'd have a show and then you would say, funny, this looks like a group show. <laughs> <laughs> and at various points, this was a kind of standing joke, right? So the solo looks like a group show. And you actually see this retrospective, you see this, it's anything but. What you see instead are driving currents that have continued, different dimensions that have continued, and all are equally relevant to, they're all dimensions of his work. So I think I would read the pattern, the focus on pattern through that optic, maybe. Sometimes it's being um, completely immersed in the murakas of the Jahangiri court or the Akbari court and saying to yourself, okay, how do I deal with these symmetries? How do I deal with these structures? So sometimes I think it's, I mean, I also see it as cross-training as an athlete or a sports person might. You're trying on different styles, seeing what, that, what different kinds of optics tell you about how to construct the world and relay that back into your own painting. So the calf, which was in Timeless Art in 89, very long ago, 88. When I first saw that painting, I really thought this is, this painting is, is coming apart. It seems to be leaping in different directions. But that might be, that might be an impulse there, you know, putting things into a painting that threaten to tear it apart and yet finding solutions that hold all those dimensions together. I don't know. Long and roundabout way of answering your very precise question. Any other questions? Sudhir, would you like to respond to some of the things that we brought up during our conversation? especially the question of violence. And how do you mediate that through your language of painting? Yeah, I mean, uh, as we, we used to often talk about it, given my, that uh, we are so focused on violence present violence, that we tend to forget that it's always been there. And we also tend to forget that it will always be there. It's part of our thing. And artists all through history have dealt with it in various ways. And image like Piero della Francesca's stab in the throat in Arezzo, that very classical kind of moment, as Guy pointed out with Roger van der Weyden and all this. What are we actually doing there? What is an artist, you know? Is he quelling his own impulse? Ultimately, I think the greater the violence in a sense that you have to deal with, the, the larger your a vessel of art needs to be to contain it. And if you can't contain it, if that violence is going to overflow through you, then that work is not successful. You know? So it has to be contained. And that is at one point, but of course, then there are, I mean, there is, uh, there are paintings that really are violent. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know, I mean, I, I, for me personally, because I'm not that kind of a painter, mm -hmm. uh, or not always, maybe in a few phases, <laughs> but uh, how do I relate to works that are extremely violent? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Gurniewald, of course, but even modern contemporary Auto works Dix. that are... Autodicks. Autodicks. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, they are at the other end, which are not, they're not classical at all. Their answer is not classical. They're not about holding it together. They're about tearing it apart. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, if, if I may, I mean, uh, how, how would you use the trope of uh, proximity and distance 
in, rela in relation to the representation of violence. I mean, to use your own trope of proximity and distance in terms of representing the other, if, it, if, if, you, if you were to use that trope in the context of representing violence, uh, you know, how would you argue out your position? Because uh, if you're talking about violence that's happening uh, you know, uh, with, with a group or a constituency with whom you don't necessarily share uh, anything in common, and then if you wish to represent that constituency, how, how would you do so? How close can you get or how far do you need to be? Yeah. I mean, you can get as close as you want, uh, but it will burn you out, as Tayyab has said. Mm. Tayyab said that if an artist allows himself, if Tayyab had continued to paint in the way in which he was painting in the 50s and 60s, he would burn out. He changed track, cooled himself, and then he created works that last kind of over 40 years. There are many artists who have burned themselves out by totally jumping into and living that violence. You know? I don't know what, what is more authentic. What is, is it escape? Is it rational? Is it, I don't know. You know but there have been artists who have sacrifice themselves at that altar also. Uh, uh, well, yeah, well, Otto, Otto, I think Otto Dix is a very interesting ex example. Uh, because uh, I have, a, uh, and Nancy has a curated, uh, didn't you curate a, a, a lecture? On uh, she gave a lecture on, on Otto Dix, yeah. And, there were, and I think the Max Muller Bhavan had a whole gallery full of Otto Dix uh, prints and drawings and things. Yeah. It's World War One, isn't it? Yes. World War One. Uh, Otto Dix's depictions of death, disease, corruption, uh, decay are so graphic, so graphic uh, that I personally find it very difficult to take them. Uh, I don't think that I can really walk through a whole room full of auto dixes and, and look at all of them with attention and come out. I think that I might look at a few and then run, you know. Uh, now, <coughs> two questions come to mind. Number one, what did he feel about this, you know, uh, day after day to depict that kind, you know, quite literally, I mean, World War I was one of the most terrible things uh, that human beings have been through because there were none of the slightly saving uh, factors which we had in World War II, you know, like antibiotics, for instance. No antibiotics. So, I mean, literally, suppurating wounds was the order of the day, you know. And Dix records all this. Almost blow by blow, you know, I mean, it must require phenomenal courage, it seems to me, for one thing. The nearest thing that I think can think of, which, which in a way, artistically, I mean, you know, it seems horrible to talk about it like this, you know, human tragedy as being artistically uh, 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 portrayable or not. But I think that Goya does some of that. Mm -hmm. I think that when Goya talks about the horrors of war, I think he takes it blow by blow. But I think something happens where, which, which allows us to be able to see this. In Autodix, uh, it's, it's, it's close to insanity, you know, I think. And, and what would it have done to the artist himself? And am I an exceptional viewer? that I find that work almost unacceptable. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, um, I just want to ask and continue with this question of uh, depicting uh, or 
the question of violence. You know, in your figures, in their facial contours, there may be a deadpan look. But I think the viewer's imagination, thinking about an emotional, a very high emotion, is ignited. <coughs> the viewer can think of this high emotion, which I would call a kind of violence, you know, a dystopian situation, like the construction worker washing her face. It's, I mean, it's got all kinds of things written on that face apart from a very direct imaging of violence itself. But the violence in a society, the, the you know, the general picture of violence is definitely there. And maybe also, I mean, and I would imagine a reference to a kind of violence also comes in. Would you generally violent and, you know, a psychological violence that happens, the person eating oneself up, like, you know. Would you say that even though directly it's not it's not seen. Yeah, I think uh, it's difficult to know exactly, but I mean, I always think that there are polarities uh, within which the artist is negotiating, and uh, desire and its opposite you know, are in some senses, and it's difficult to put a name to that opposite, but violence is one, you know. Uh, the fact that desire itself can lead to violence is uh, another thing, but I don't know, I mean, psychologically how those paths go. But for example, the painting, the last painting that Give showed, uh, the dead bodies on the table and uh, those nude figures on the ceiling. Uh, so references do, I mean, one does use references, but I don't know, it's really difficult to kind of say anything for specifically about it. No, I'm saying a f f imagination can, any ones, whether the viewer's imagination or the or just a general person, I mean, can imagine that. I mean, you've left it to that tightness of a situation where this imagination is ignited, like I've said. You yeah, know, that, is, that is very true. I mean, each yeah. one brings his own life experience to viewing. And, uh, and which I find very fascinating because without letting it outpour in your paintings yes. or come out as a projection in uh, an overdue and, uh, or an excess in all the painterly terms is avoided and instead you have this kind of just as a background almost of what can be violence and so many other things of course you know yeah i mean yeah. it's strange to say that but that painting of killing uh, i would ultimately want that to be a beautiful painting you know yes so in that sense one does not want to give up on the idea of beauty just wants to expand yeah. it to be able to hold. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was reminded of Pina Bausch, the uh, dance dancers, if you, the German, uh, who depicted dance movements and all these things. Whether it was feeling a seasonal cold, or whether it was some terrific tragedy, or whether it was an actual physical fight in terms of dance. And she, there are many examples, if you see her videos, I mean, they're there on YouTube as well, where the dance is, it's primary, you know, primarily a dance. But whatever kind of actual killing and violence that actually is the sort of subject matter is very much there. And you, you have a pleasure in the dance. You take pleasure in the dance. Pina Bausch. Thank you. Thank you for your intervention, uh, Roshan. And as Sudhir was saying that, I mean, he wants the painting killing to still be beautiful at the end of the day. 
and I was just thinking about what Yeats said, which is a terrible beauty, even if it's a terrible beauty. So I think Suhit uh, wanted to ask a question, right? So could you please give the mic to Uh, hi, sir. Uh, my question is uh, for the painter. In a couple of your uh, paintings in this exhibition, uh, the, uh, the photographic camera, the camera, uh, either appears in the frame or it is, uh, or the painting is a commentary on photography as such or deals with the subject of the still image as a, as a form of comment on it. <laughs> uh, may I ask you about uh, the role of photography in your uh, creative process in terms of either gathering reference material or uh, in some way a response to what you've seen in photography. Could I, could I draw you out on that? I don't think uh, it's a response to, uh, I've not, I've not really kind of uh, seen photography from that point of view. I'm using it as a tool. And uh, I started to use it more and more in the last 20, 30 years. And it plays a big role, uh, but always a subsidiary role ultimately. Uh, those self-portraits in which the camera and appears, I mean, they are essentially about modes of representation, you know? So different modes of representation uh, give you uh, one, a photograph gives you one view, a mirror gives you one view, a painting gives you another view. And the self is kind of, you know, somewhere you can say it's, uh, floating between these or trapped between these different views. So that's, that was the area that I was exploring with the photographs. But photography is a very useful uh, thing for me uh, to be used in, in, in different ways, but not really as a photographer would use it. Any more questions? Yes. She first spoke of uh, reading uh, violence in, in different ways. I mean, uh, the case in point can be cynic, mm. huh? where like the, the title of the painting is cynic. So one is sure that uh, the acts that cynics do, uh, he's sure to do. And he's too cynic, of course, and he has a tikka and he avoids your gaze, but uh, he looks out of the window. He, he pretends like looking out of the window, but he isn't actually, maybe. Uh, but, I mean, that painting to me always depicts some kind of economic violence. Ase kiti zana ahet, asa ze astana, te. I mean, I'm, I'm left with, left alone with that situation. How many guys? Abhijit, it's amazing because that that's a fascinating painting. Because I, I think for me what makes it is that strange undefined curtain or whatever it is, or is it a hand in close up, arm in close up, what is it that's, that effectively threatens this guy? So there's an incredible, uh, and it hinges on knowing the title and making the connection with the Tika, but there's a sense in which this man's vulnerable marginality and the look in his eye and the role that he takes on in his, because of this political affiliation, which will then allow him to assert himself in some way. I mean, all that comes across in an incredible compressed way in that painting. And I think it's, uh, it stands along with all the choreographies of violence because it talks about what, it, what is being spoken to by political forces that emphasize violence. They give you that sense that your marginality and your irrelevance can all be compensated for through some great ritual act of violence and participation in that. And that's what's captured there. It's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing meditation on class location of a certain kind, uh, the pull of a politics of resentment. It's, yeah, absolutely. 
it's again it's it's how much an image can compress and how much it can relay it's also thank you uh, ranjit for this lovely insight and also uh, the fact that this is one of those works where there is a direct title which again is is very interesting because you chose to title this painting scenic so i think uh, is there something that you'd like to say uh, about this i mean making that choice in in the title because then you know you're immediately signaling to people who this person is and then on the one hand you have the title which is very specific and then you have this um, this mass of ambiguity it's almost like flesh or cloth uh, or again a hindrance it's like a bad photograph like something has come in the way but the the fact is that you know i mean the scenic is also a cipher of history in a way who's come in the way of violent urban development uh, and that's why in the exhibition also we have it near lower parade and also the man in that striped pajama uh, sitting you know i mean so we have them as companion pieces to we have them as companion pieces to uh, lower parade so would you like to say something about the ambiguity uh, i think the title came to me uh, as i was doing the painting the initial uh, like subject uh, of that work uh, was just an ordinary mm. person but uh, this this particular and that refers to sometimes what photographs can actually give you mm. for example that you know you're sitting in a local train and you're kind of just clicking and someone's arm is in the way but then you look at the photograph and you suddenly realize something's happened here mm. and uh, so when i'm using this image then i start to think that what has happened here points to and my ambiguous feeling towards uh, that class and that kind of uh, youth mm -hmm. who one sympathizes with because he's really like looking to find himself in some say some way mm -hmm. and the fact that this way is mm -hmm. the one which will uh, it 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 gives him various things one knows you know mm -hmm. that as long as it's working from below upwards mm -hmm. it's doing positive things for him mm -hmm. you know working with community distributing school notebooks connecting with locals mm -hmm. etc etc mm -hmm. and then as it as he as it the pressure from top mm -hmm. uh, the ideology seeps in then it takes different directions trapped within these a uh, uh, genuine kind of wish to do some social good mm. and the pathway that will lead to only these mm. now that's that trap is what one strikes yes. any more questions I think this has been a very interesting conversation at least we here sitting on the stage definitely have enjoyed ourselves and I yes. and I hope that all of you too have enjoyed this conversation uh, and I also like the fact that you know I mean the conversation also went in the same way that so these paintings uh, you know function you know quietly sort of you know quietly but also uh, in a very focused manner so i think that there's something about the conversation and your paintings mirroring each other uh, focus moderation tact measure. measure exactly all of those things so uh, thank you very much for being here for being patient and thank you once again sudhir for inviting me to curate your show not at all i mean it's been extremely uh, i'm i'm extremely grateful for the curation of course as i said led up and for this evening when i have friends kind of you know uh, talking about my work and keeping all the kind of uh, uh, incisive criticisms for later thank you much Uh, on behalf of the guild i would like to thank our speakers ranjit hoskote nancy adajania give patel and of course sudeep sir and our audience for being so patient
and uh, our next event uh, is the walkthrough conducted by the artist and the curator Nancy which is on the 9th of Jan and uh, there's also a lecture by an artist art critique and curator Timothy Hyman which will again be moderated by Nancy which is on the 11th of Jan and uh, we have a list of all the outreach events on the registration desk so whoever is interested can have it for themselves yeah have a wonderful evening thank you once again Thank you.